Oh, the Lord is wonderful, is He not? I could sit all day and sing and worship the Lord today with you, and what a joy to do so with you. My name is Bob Fugate. I'm married to my dear wife, Cheryl, and we make our home when we're in the United States. We center out of Dubois, PA. If any of you been up there on Route 80, you kind of know where it is, right? There's nothing up there, and all of a sudden there's a sign for Dubois, and we're out in the middle of nowhere. But it's, it's good. Last time I was with you, we were downtown uh, at the church down there, so that's been a while. And it's, if I forgot your name, please forgive me. It's not because I don't like you. I'm just getting older, and I'm forgetting. But it is so good to be back, and I feel like I'm at a home and with family. Uh, seeing Pastor uh, Clarence and Kathy, we just, just a joy to spend time with them, and we don't get enough time together. We wish we had more. Uh, and the blessing that God has been. And, and we'll be praying with you, too. You, your church is coming upon an opportunity. I see it as an opportunity. Whenever we have change, it's an excellent opportunity for God to work in our lives and to direct us and we naturally tend to depend and look more and seek more of the Lord out when we're in those times of change. So this is a great opportunity you have coming uh, to seek the Lord and find Him as He moves among you. Uh, before we get going today, just let you know, I do have prayer cards. They're on the back table back there. My table is actually back there. And uh, if you want to grab one, please do so. Take it and uh, uh, our email is on there as well. Uh, if you can always get a hold of me, contact me, feel free. We would love to hear from you, write you, uh, write to you if you answer back. And uh, if not, just put it there and pray for us uh, as well. We, Cheryl and I came back in, uh, we've been here three months now in the U.S. Uh, we're going to go back in another month to Mexico. I'm finally getting used to being in the U.S. I have not gotten any traffic tickets so far in the area. <laughs> it's, the, the red lights here mean something, you know, they actually mean stop. <laughs> to us in Guadalajara, it's more like a suggestion, you know. And so I'm amazed at the people who put their brakes on and stop. But I'm, getting, I'm just now getting used to driving around here, and now i got to go back to, to the way they drive. Also, I had the guys hand out, I think they handed these out in the, in the bulletins. It's just a card. If you're interested in getting more information from us down the road, you can put your name and email on this and just leave it on your chairs, or if you want to put them on the back table. If you don't want to, just leave it on the chair. Don't worry about it. But I will, we will collect them and put you on our emailing list to get uh, things out to you by the next, uh, probably about six weeks, four weeks, about every six weeks we'll put out information about what's happening in Guadalajara in our ministry. And also, uh, I also have uh, CDs we had um, recorded for us in Mexico. It's all Spanish. So if you don't speak Spanish, you're probably not going to understand a word of it, okay? And it's great electric guitar. If you like 80s rock, you'll love this. If you don't, you probably won't like it. But you might know somebody that's Spanish. Mexican and uh, get it for them. I'm giving them as for donations and your donations will go towards the um, construction of our building and our land that we hope to do next year. Uh, the guy who does the music, his name is Arturo. You'll meet him on the video. He's an excellent musician. He's one of the Mexicans top electric guitarists. Uh, he travels the country regularly. He's all the time on um, uh, tours. We get him 50, that was a deal, 50% of the time He'd have to be in church on Sundays as worship leader, and the other 50% he's out touring. And he also tours the U.S. He was in, he was in uh, Chicago in July, and last year he got stuck in Denver, and that mass, they had a massive snowstorm in the spring, and he did not know what to do there. And so he'll be around in the back, but he's in he's a Spanish thing. There's Christian lyrics on there, so if you have a Spanish friend you want to give it to, you can do that and give it to him as a gift, and any donation will help us with our building. Amen? Okay, guys, good to be here. Uh, and as I said... Uh, Things about Mexico, Cheryl and I love Guadalajara. I want to say that off the beginning. We spent 25 years in Chile, Santiago, Chile. We are now transferred in 214 to Guadalajara. It was a good thing when we redeployed because the alliance is closing out, transitioning out of Chile. And that's because the church has grown so strong. We've met our goals and our objectives. And our last missionary, Dave and Luann Warner, are pulling out uh, next July. So we'll be transitioning out of there. And it's a good thing because the Chilean church is over 127 churches. They've been self-sustaining since 1938 uh, before the war. And they send their own missionaries. They take their own Great Commission Fund, which much like you do with your pledges. They do that in Chile. We, we taught them the same thing. And they send out their missionaries around the world now and sustain them. And so we're so grateful for the work that the Lord has done in that country. Cheryl and I didn't know if we are going to make the adjustment or not to Guadalajara. Uh, we weren't sure if uh, the Lord would be able to, we, we didn't want to leave, let's put it that way. You don't want to leave a place you've grown to love. But we have fallen in love with Guadalajara. 
Uh, it's about 6,000 feet up, so it's temperate. It's good weather all year round, just about. January gets a little cold, so we're getting a little cold in January. I might have to put a sweater on. might get down to 48 degrees in January. So I'll be thinking of you all while I'm on my palm tree line beach, three and a half hours west of Guadalajara, down by Puerto Vallarta. Did anyone ever watch The Love Boat years ago? You can admit it. It's okay. It's okay. I know you do. Yep. And they're doing reruns. I saw that. They have this thing called Me TV now. They say, you, we watch the reruns of the old TV shows. Well, it would stop at Puerto Vallarta. That's one of the stops. That's why I'm saying that. And uh, we're only three and a half hours there. So we'll be, we get down to the beach every chance we get just to relax, retool, and, and equip. Uh, and Cheryl and I have fallen in love. Mexico also, a couple of things about Mexico. The, uh, Mexico, Mexico is the number, it's the le- world's 11th largest country. Uh, about 111 million people. It's moving up to the number 10 slot pretty soon. It also is the world's largest Spanish-speaking country in the world. It's, it's the world's largest Spanish-speaking country. We, that's because Brazil, which is larger, South America, but Brazil does not speak Spanish. They speak Portuguese, which I don't speak either. And those Brazilians, man, they do their own thing. So Mexico is the world's largest Spanish-speaking country. Guess, guess who is the world's second largest? I have to phrase this correctly. The second largest populated country that speaks Spanish, the United States. We got the second largest number of Spanish speakers in the world, next to Mexico. The uh, border between the United States and Mexico is the world's second largest land border in the world. Guess what the largest land border in the world is between two countries? Us and Canada. Yeah. So there's a, there's a number of things. It's a gorgeous place, very diverse, and we have really, really fallen in love with these dear, wonderful people. They were voted the most humble people in the world this year, and I believe it. They're just gracious, and uh, the people themselves have wonderful hearts. They have taken us in, accepted us, and loved us, and Cheryl and I are having such a joy getting to know them and share with them. We go back in this year anxious to continue on uh, with the church plant. The Alliance sent us there to plant a church. There's three Alliance churches in Guadalajara. We're number four. They've been, we've been there about 26 years. The Alliance missionaries, there's three couples working in Guadalajara. And uh, Janice Greenfield is coming back next year. Her husband, Tim, died in March teaching over Tacoa. And he died, so Tim, we've lost Tim, but Janice is going to come back. That's going to be a help. The Canadians are working in Mexico City. The Canadian Alliance has about 18 or so missionaries in Mexico City. And it's just been tough going. It's been slow. It's been tough going. In Guadalajara, after 26 years, we only had three churches under 100 in the city. A city of 6 million people. So that's just a drop in the bucket. And then Mexico City is 26 million people. So we uh, ask for your prayer, your support as Cheryl and I go back. And we appreciate so much your generosity, but also your support. So today, we're going to center on uh, today on uh, uh, talking about fulfilling God's purpose in our lives and doing so in a way that, that is faithful and expecting God to bless us and to show up when we need Him as we do that. That's what we're going to talk about today. It's going to be coming out of uh, 1 Peter. If you have your Bibles or your phones, we're going to be looking at, for in a little bit, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 is where we're going to be coming from. It's an excellent, excellent chapter. But first, I want to present you with some peculiar people. You've seen it. Uh, I think you have the, in the hallway there the peculiar people things. We've been talking about this week about peculiar people, and that does not mean weird Okay? Strange. No, this is, this is, the KJV, I believe, uses that word peculiar in 1 Peter 2. But the concept here is special. <laughs> special, chosen, different. We're all for a purpose. So we are all chosen of God, and we are all, in that sense, peculiar people. Not strange, not we're peculiar. And I want to introduce you to several peculiar couples. Three of them, they're Mexicans. They helped us start the church plant. We got to know them in 214, 215 we started the church. You'll see Eduardo and his wife Sara. Eduardo is the one who speaks the most. He has very good English. He wants to be a pastor. Praise God. He's coming on side with me. We'll be co-pastors. He'll be helping me this next year. And he's going into ministry. We're so excited that it happened like this. He's a great guy. He'll be sharing a little bit. He works for Dell Computers right now. His wife owns a gym. So uh, it's really been tough when we do our, our couples meetings every Friday with them because I like food, you know, pizza, popcorn, potato chips. But his wife, she has a gym, and they're all about nutrition. So it's like goat cheese 
and no salt on the cracker and carrot sticks. You know what I mean? But great lady, and you got to give her credit. You'll also see on here uh, Sergio Nayeli, another couple who have joined the team. They are both lawyers. They have two children. They love the Lord, and they have come on board. Sergio doesn't speak a lot of English. He's, he understands it, but he's going to be sitting there like this the whole time, but he's really a teddy bear. And Nayeli's just the most wonderful hostess you ever meet. And then Arturo and his wife, Rox, are on here as well. They're the third couple helping us in this church planning team. They are like our lay pastors. They're down there running the church right now while Cheryl and I are gone. They're assuming all the ministry responsibilities. And Arturo is the musician, his wife, Rox. They don't speak a lot of English, and they were kind of nervous, so he's only going to say just a couple of things. But would you take a look at these couple because these three families are excellent examples of peculiar people. So guys, could we have that? Thank you. Hello, brothers and sisters at the U.S. Um, we are really, really glad we got that um, th this is a good opportunity for, for us to share our experience with, with you and what is God doing in Guadalajara. And God is doing beautiful things in our community in Aliento de Vida. And all we wanted to, to let you know is that we need you. We need your help. We need your prayers, mostly your prayers. We need you to pray for us, for all our ministries, and for the people that actually are coming to our church. And um, we have uh, uh, this land now that we bought. We have it, and, and we need to build. And we, need, we have this big need and huge need to build a building uh, to cover all the needs that we have now here in our community we need to have a church we need to have classrooms we need to have bathrooms we need to have uh, a lot of things to to give a, a better service to our community and we wanted to let you know that we have great leadership here with robert and cheryl and we are really glad to know them and we praise god for them and and that's all we wanted to to let you know and i just want to say thank you thank you for for all your support thank you for for me, uh, like you, thank you for many times that you have come to to help to building the church or do many things um, for our our church for our people. And you can be sure that when you come, you are gonna be so loved and you are gonna be so welcome in our house because we have the love the, the, that God give us. Hello, I am Arturo Ibarra, and I am very happy to talk with you and I think if we live like Jesus Christ everybody is 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 trying to find the truth in Jesus Christ uh, great look at the uh, folks that we've come to dearly love and I call them peculiar because of the way they have agreed to serve the Lord and follow his purposes in Guadalajara to plant a church and give their lives to plant a church in Guadalajara. In the minutes that we have this morning, I just want to share a little bit about some of the ways the Lord has been working and also to help us get a grasp on. But first, I need to present you to my dear, wonderful wife, Cheryl. Cheryl and I, uh, she's in the eastern area of the state right now, and we've split up to cover more churches. We just have so little time in the U.S. We only have four months, and she's over somewhere in Camp Hill, Philly. I'm not sure where she is today, just preaching her heart out. And she's really the better of the two of us. So you guys kind of got stuck with me. But bless her heart, uh, God has continued to use her. Now, dear Cheryl, when uh, I met her at Penn State, uh, by the way, God loves people all over the world, and even those who wear red and white, so... We love you too, brothers. Uh, dear Cheryl and I met at Penn State, and uh, I'd been praying for two years for a, a woman who would be willing to be a missionary and to live uh, out in the jungles far away from home and be far away from home and those kinds of things. And I said, Lord, I'm going to need a woman who's going to be like that. It doesn't hurt if she's good looking either. That'll help. And so praise the Lord, I ran into Cheryl when uh, she was, uh, we were both freshmen at Penn State. And my, my calling to, to the ministry started at, at 13. I accepted Christ in an Alliance Church. We had never gone to Alliance Church. We thought they were a cult, honestly. My parents thought they were a sect. And so if you're new here today, don't worry about it. We, we've been there. 
Um, we went there because uh, and my dad moved into Dubois, and uh, we were new there, and he was a doc, and he put an ad in the paper. I'm going to open up practice and whatnot. Patients, welcome. Some guy from a church visited us on a Saturday, and he said, hey, I just want to invite you to come over to the church. It's Lions, Christian Mission Lions Church, and blah, blah, blah. And we closed the door, and we thought, that must be like Jehovah's Witnesses or something like that. They are strange. But my mother said, we have to go there because uh, he was so kind to come invite us. So we'll go there one Sunday, and then we'll go to where we belong, in the proper church. Right, and, and I won't say which that was, but you get that idea. So we, we went there, and it was crazy. It was Missionary Sunday, and it was nuts. People were jumping up and down. They were having fun. It was all crazy, and we loved it. We loved it. I thought, we're never going to go to this church. No way. I'm uh, going to go to that church. It was too much fun, and my mom and dad looked at each other. I was in the back seat, and they said, we found our church. I've never seen anybody enjoy church so much like those people. It was just wonderful, and they were given the missions, and so folks, we got to remember to celebrate sometimes, right? Amen? Uh, while we're here, and, and I said, Lord, I, I love this idea, and when I was 14, um, we formed, my brother and I formed a rock group, a Christian rock group. Now, in the early 70s, a Christian rock group really wasn't all that well received in Dubois, Pennsylvania, okay? Uh, they were used to like the Gaither Trio. You know what I'm talking about here? The Gatton boys, that kind of stuff. Yeah, the gospel guys, and we just weren't quite that way. And so they, we didn't get received too well. We were what you call peculiar, were we not? But we were serving the cause. We were preaching Christ. And I'll never forget a little Methodist church, Clearfield, Pennsylvania, just down the road. Clearfield Methodist Church, stately church downtown. And they must have thought they were getting the, 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 the quartet. But they invited us in anyway. So we put up all our amplifiers along the stage and whatnot, and boy, did we play loud. Man, we go at it. And when we were said and done, uh, we were strange to those folks. But something happened. A dear lady came up to me. Never forget after this, I'm 14, by now, and I had shared a little bit about my new life in Christ, my testimony all of one year <laughs> of being a Christian. But I just talked about my love of God. And she came up and she said, young man, and she looked to be about 95 years old. Now, to a 14-year-old, that meant 14-year-old term, she's probably about 38, okay, or 42. And she said, I just want you to know, my life has been changed forever. When you shared your testimony, I, I understood, and I'm giving my life to Christ. And man, I was amazed at that. I thought, wow, look at what God can do. And I, I just thought, I just, that's it. That's what I want. This is what I want for my life. Folks, can I encourage you today? Find God's purpose for your life. Fulfill his purposes, because there is nothing better. There is no better way to live this life. It is exciting. It is wonderful. And the Lord wants to use each and every one of us. He made you the way you are to use you for a purpose to serve him. And he has you here for a purpose today. So can I encourage you to do that? And dear Cheryl, when I ran into her at Penn State, I knew what I wanted to do and those kinds of things. But unfortunately, Cheryl wanted to be a nun. So it was kind of hard on me. She did want to be a missionary. That was the good point. She wanted to be a missionary to Central America all her life. But she thought she was going to be a nun. So I was debating and looking up in the scripture, where does it talk about how to date a nun? And I couldn't find it in the Bible. It wasn't there. And I decided, well, she's not really a nun. She just wants to be a nun. So I'm going to go ahead and date her anyway. And man, praise the Lord. She had come to Christ at Penn State before that. A, lady, a young gal from Campus Crusade lived on her dorm floor, saw her going to Mass every single day. And she said, what are you doing? And she shared Christ with her. And she had never heard this before. The, lady, the girl had a Bible in her hands. And she said, you're allowed to have that? And she didn't think you'd have a Bible in your hands. And she, she was able to look at the Bible, and she realized our faith is about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not religion. It's about a relationship with God. And that changed her life. And so when, as that started, we started talking. She came to Christ. She still thought she was going to be a missionary nun, but after a while, we convinced her, the Lord and I, <laughs> <laughs> to get married and to be a missionary with the Alliance. So praise the Lord for what he's done. I'm going to talk uh, in my emails and my letters. You're going to hear about Project South Point. Does that ring a name to you guys? It sure does. That was a few years ago. I was back around this area. I was looking for a name that would, would give an idea of a big, broad general ministry that we're going to be doing in Guadalajara in the next years. And I decided South Point's a good one. It's below the border. And also our headquarters is going to be in the south side of uh, Guadalajara. And so I took South Point with the E for our, our, our overall project name, and we're the only ones in the alliance with this. And so if you ever look us up for the giving, we're going to be South Point, folks. The Circle of Silence is the area where we've been assigned to, to Guadalajara. It sits in the middle of Mexico, in the middle of that circle. It's an area of Mexico where there's less than 2% evangelical believers very little access to the gospel in this area. It's about six or seven states now, I figured out, that, are, that comprise this circle. 
Guadalajara sits in the mid- middle of that area. And then the, there's several indigenous groups. I talked about that this week a little bit. Several indigenous groups who live up in the northern end of that. And uh, those folks have absolutely no tolerance for the gospel. Uh, they persecute Christians. You cannot have a Bible. It's illegal to be a Christian. And they persecute believers. And so we have a lot of work to cut out for us to be able to share the gospel and the light with these people who are up in this area. Uh, the circle in this area, I figured out about 1.94% believers right now from what I've been able to put together. So if you have your Bibles... And you look at the New Testament at 1 Peter. Um, if you don't know where that is, it's New Testament, and it's right before 2 Peter. Okay? Can't miss it. Uh, chapter 2, verses 6 to 8 say the following. Uh, that is why Peter is saying to these people, that is why scriptures say, and we know that when the New Testament says the scriptures say, they're not referring to the New Testament, are they? They're referring to the Old Testament. And he says, I'm, I'm laying in a, a chosen and precious cornerstone. In Zion. And the person who believes in him will never be ashamed. This honor belongs to those who believe. Peter was talking to a group of believers. These were uh, uh, Jewish believers who were in a tough spot. They were being persecuted. They were starting to question their faith. Uh, It was a difficult time. And so they're starting to wonder what's going on here. What happened? What happened? Have you ever been there? And he's writing them and telling them, this is who you are. And it, just, it doesn't come from me, it comes from the scripture, and he's quoting Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. These people probably would have recognized that he was quoting Isaiah when he wrote this. So he's telling them, this is who you are, and it's prophecy. It's not just today. We're talking about the plan of God. We're talking about something that God has foredestined, and God has divinely planned. And so we can rest assured in that. One of the things I, I want to draw our attention to is that uh, Peter says, uh, I'm laying a cornerstone in Zion, a person who believes in him, not in it. They were used to believing in it. They were used to believing in the temple sacrificial system. But now they understand Jesus Christ died, forgave us of our sins, rose again, and we have life in Christ by the grace of God. And Peter says, you, you, you believe in him. And folks, this was Old Testament. This is not New Testament. This is the prophet Isaiah prophesying Jesus Christ. And now Peter's telling him, now we're talking today. We are not to believe in an it. And if that's what you're doing today, it's going to get disappointing. We're called to a relationship with God, and we're called to believe in him. That's the basis of our faith. And so I'm so thankful to have known the Lord and be able to share this with these folks in Guadalajara. You know what they're doing? They're, they're worshiping an it, a system, a church. But they don't know God. And we're there to share Him with them and to know Him personally, to have that relationship as Cheryl and I did. The word peculiar comes out of here. If you have that, if you have the KJV Bible, it comes out of here. Peculiar. But again, that does not mean weird nor strange as our dear friends in Dubois thought. Guadalajara is a city of 6 million people, second largest city in Mexico. It's a beautiful place, as I said. Cheryl and I enjoy working there. But how do you decide where you're going to plant a church in this area? And we started looking for uh, what are the uh, least reached areas of the city? Where are the fewest churches? That's one of the things we look for. And we began to pray about this and pray about this and try to understand, God, where and, and how do we start? We had three churches there. They're all, under, they're all under 100 in attendance, 26 years. It's been slow going. It's been hard. It's been dry. I say, Lord, what can we do? Where can we start to have this church? 1 Peter 2, 6, 8, he goes on to talk to the dear people. And he says, to those who don't believe, the stone that the builders rejected, and he's talking about Jesus Christ here, has become the cornerstone. A stone that people find offensive. The people tripped over the word because they refused to believe it. Therefore, this is how they ended up. And so Peter's talking about all the opposition they're facing. And folks, we're going to face opposition. As we fulfill God's purposes on earth, we are going to face opposition. Nobody ever said it's going to be easy. And so when life gets difficult and things get tough, we need to turn back to the Lord. And dear Cheryl, when she came to Christ, it was beautiful. She was so excited. She realized she could be a missionary and get married, <laughs> even to a guy like me. She thought it was wonderful, but her family didn't think it was so wonderful. And they were offended. 
And, and Christ became a mountain of offense to them. So much so that, that when we got married, Cheryl had to walk down the aisle herself because parents said, we're not coming. There's, we want nothing to do with this. And they kind of kicked her out of the house. And she didn't want to offend her family. She didn't, she didn't want to be the offense. Folks, we are not called to be the offenders here, okay? <laughs> Jesus Christ is the one people have trouble with, not us. Uh, we're called to love everybody. And so dear Cheryl walks down by herself. And it dawned on me as, uh, as she's coming down the aisle and I'm looking. It dawned on me that every step she takes down that aisle years ago towards me, is a step away from her family. She's getting further and further away from them. She's getting closer and closer to me. And it's a lot like that with us in the Lord. Every step we take to the Lord is a step away from the world. And God's calling us to something radically different. He's calling us to make decisions and walk closer to Him. And He's calling us to, an average, to a life that's not the average Christian life. We're called to a lot more than just sit in a chair in a pew and enjoy the service. We're called to serve the living God. Because we are chosen by Him. And it means we're going to have opposition. And Cheryl had opposition. We got married and praise the Lord. It took a couple of years before we get back to the family and see him again. But the grandkids really helped out. Our, our children really helped out. And I want you to know that it ended really well. After 30 years, wow, God just blessed. And it ended well. But Cheryl had to decide she's going to pay a price. And look what Peter says. You go on verses 9 and 10. He says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. And a priesthood, if we can think about it simply, is the idea that we are taking people before God. We can do that in prayer. We can do it in different ways. And we're taking God to people. So we think of this, the sense of a priest being that we're just trying to help people draw close to the Lord. So we're taking them to Him to them and taking them before Him. That's our job. And we are, Peter's saying we're all called to do that. We're all called to do that. This is something he's called, and it's a royal uh, priesthood because we're serving the Lord. And so God has called each and every one of us. And one of the questions we have to answer is, how am I serving out that calling today where I am? To where God has me and the gifts He's given me, the talents He's given me, how am I serving the Lord? How am I fulfilling this calling that He has on me to be a priesthood? And it's not only a priesthood to the local believers, it's also global. It's also global. So we have a reach. And they would have understood this from Isaiah. It is to bring God to people and people to God, not just locally, but also on a global scale, as God has called us. And how am I fulfilling that and doing that? And he goes on to say, a holy nation. And folks, we're not alone in this. If you ever felt that God has kind of abandoned you, you've ever you wondered what happened to him, or you feel like you're the only one that's doing this, and you're the only one that cares, praise the Lord in the alliance. We have over 2,000 churches in the United States. We gather together. We take up a missions pledge to everybody. And you know what? Together we do great things. And you might think, what's a dollar going to be? Pastor Kroska said 1% more. You might, ah, what's that going to be? What's 50 cents going to be? But you know what? Together, we do great things, things that we can't do alone. We are called together to do this, and we get to do it together, and that's what the Alliance has been about. We are a part of that. So we belong to the Lord, Peter says. You were chosen to tell about the excellent qualities of God who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. I'm going to share with you one of the ways that I believe God will keep his promise to us in Peter that God will show up when we need him, when we are living our life out of love for the Lord and fulfilling that purpose of being priests here on the earth. The Lord will show up. This is a restaurant in Guadalajara praying a lot about where we start our first church. Lord, how and where? What's going to happen? And I found a place, and I was convinced it was God's place. I was convinced it was a place for us. It just had to be. And I'm, I'm one of those guys that when I get something in my head, it just has to be that way, and, and they call that stubbornness. I call that persistence, okay? Faithful persistence. My wife calls it stubbornness. But I was convinced this is the place. And we began to talk to about to our three couples and, and, and began to share with them, and we decided, you know what, we're going to rent this place and start having services there. We had to do a lot of cleanup. It was, it was abandoned in many ways. We had to paint. We had to get rid of the rats. We had to get rid of the scorpions. We had to, to put down a cement floor. We had this in the middle of it. It's going to be my coffee center. Oh, I was so looking forward to that being my coffee center. Can you imagine that? It's been beautiful. And it had an auditorium abandoned for 5,000 people. So I'm already dreaming, wow, we're going to fill this baby up, 5,000 people. And it had to be the place. We worked so hard, and we were finishing up this cement floor five days before we are going to do our first service. We were almost done after about a month and a half of work. We're going to have our first service. We're finishing up this floor. And this guy comes up behind me, 9 o'clock Tuesday morning. Remember, Sunday morning, we're starting church. 
And he says, hey, are you the pastor? I said, yes, I am. He says, okay, good. He says, get your stuff and get out. He says, I'm the new owner and you have to leave. <laughs> I was shocked. I looked up and said, no, 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 you don't understand. We're having church here Sunday morning and you can come if you want. He says, no, 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 I'm the new owner. Get out. Get your stuff and get out now. Well, we went around for a while and we weren't giving in. So finally we decided to go to his office and talk about it at his office. And that's when he said, Pastor, I'm now in charge. Basically, he was from a drug cartel. He came from a drug cartel. Peter says in chapter 2, verses 11, 12, he says, Although they ridicule you, and folks, you will find opposition to fulfilling God's purposes in your life, I guarantee it. Although they ridicule you as if you were doing wrong while they are watching you do good things, they will praise God. When? The day God comes to help you. Because you know what happens? They see God. They don't see us. But the day God comes to help us because we're fulfilling His will, they see God in action. Not us. They see God. That's what happens in this beautiful kingdom dynamic, and that's how people begin to come to Christ. That's how they become convinced. We were living this thing out with this dear guy. Um, this is kind of the neighborhood we were in, very kind of middle class. We have a beautiful home, by the way, in that area. We love it and whatnot. But this is the reality of the country we're in. The context is a very difficult place in many ways, very, very, very uh, violent in many ways. The drug wars are such that they're shooting each other, such that more people have died in Mexico. Uh, this was taken, I believe, 270 to 214 than in, uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq combined. Think about that for a sec, below our border. It's the drug wars. They're not necessarily shooting us, they're shooting each other, but you get caught in a crossfire and whatnot. Well, the guy who wanted that restaurant was a cartel guy, and he wanted to launder money through it. And uh, he wanted us out. He did not want a church meeting in what was going to be a money laundering operation for a drug cartel. Okay? He wanted us out. And uh, in talking with him, going to his office and whatnot, and he said, no. He said, you've got to go. And I said, well, we're going we're gonna, to uh, come anyway, and uh, we're going to meet here Sunday. And he said, no. He said, if you do that, I'm locking the gates. And so I said, well, we'll just meet outside. And he said, well, if you do that, we'll beat you up and whatnot. And so I thought, okay. Uh, I'll go talk to the group. So I went back and we talked Tuesday night with our core group. We prayed. We had a meeting at that Tuesday night house. And I asked them, husbands and wives, I know what I wanted to do. Sharon, I knew. But I asked each one of them, what do you want to do? And this was a time for them to take a step of faith and decide what they want to do. And it's a time for them to say, Lord, can we trust you or not? Because that great promise of Peter, that wonderful promise that God will show up when we need him, praise the Lord they believed that. And can you imagine for me, the leader of this group, how hard that was for me? Because I had to go to this group and tell them I was wrong. That was hard. I had to say, guys, I'm so sorry. I, I misunderstood what God was doing. I thought this is going to be for us. I really did. But I guess I was wrong. I can't believe it. I can't believe I misunderstood what God was doing. And I was wrong. But that night, what happened to our group and what God did with that group was he told them or they understood they're committed to this, not because they're following Bob Fugate, not because it's Bob Fugate's their church. They're committing to this because they're following Jesus Christ and because it's God's church. That's what they would realize they were committing to. They wasn't just trying to start something and do something on our own. They all realized we're in God's hands now. This is God's church, and, and we're going to follow him faithfully because we can trust him. And I was so overjoyed that they made that decision. And they realized I'm fallible. They realized I don't know what I'm doing. They thought I knew what I was doing up to this point, and they realized I don't. But they realized God knows what he's doing. They realized they could trust him. And I was so overjoyed. I went back to our, my dear cartel guy the next day. They wanted me to ask to, for him to give us $150,000 back in, in, in uh, what do you call it, emotional suffering. Because the two of them were lawyers. I said, yeah, right. <laughs> I did go back there and get all our money back. I took all the bills and receipts for all the money we put in that place, fixed it up. I put it on an Excel thing. I gave it to him, and I put it on the, uh, the smallest font and number eight. Did you ever try and read Excel, number eight, smallest font? You can't. The guy was so mad. And I knew he'd have to like, go really slow, so I knew he'd have to agree to everything that's on there, and which he did, by the way. He paid us almost everything. But this guy was mad, and he said, Pastor, I just want you, because I said, we're coming here Sunday morning. And he said, well, I just want you to know, I got a tape of you robbing me, my truck. You were taking money out of my truck, and it's on videotape. This guy had gotten a picture of me, tried to make a tape of me robbing him and whatnot. And he says, you're going to jail because we own the judges and we own the, the policemen, which they do. 
And then these words came out of my mouth. It, it was not me. They came out of my mouth. I said, well, that's okay. Mexico needs prison ministry. <laughs> I'm serious. I thought, oh, Lord, no. No, 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 no. My wife's not going to be happy. And I just, oh, I know we need it, but please, no. I don't, I don't think I can do that. And uh, I was concerned. And he looked at me kind of strange, and he said, okay, that's not working. So he said, well, Pastor, he said, um, he said, you know, uh, sometimes the people, the children disappear. And he was dead serious. They kidnap all the time. He was talking about Sergio Nayeli's two little boys. He saw them. He was dead serious. They were going to take the two boys, and they're gone. So when he said that, I realized, okay, Lord, uh, I will not risk the lives of these dear children. We will not do that. And I told him, we'll leave. We will leave, and we'll go find a place. And, and he gave us the money back, and he realized, and he had a change of heart. And this guy looks at me, and he goes, you know what, Pastor, I've decided that you can meet here for a couple of Sundays. You can have church here till you find a place to rent. Because I've been telling him it's impossible. How am I going to find a place to rent in four days and then get it ready for church? It's impossible. And he said, no, no, you can meet here for a couple of days. And I was so overjoyed to hear that. And then these words came out of my mouth. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, sir, uh, we don't need you. We don't want your help. And I said something like, we, God is going to give us a better place. It's going to be nicer than your place. It's going to be cheaper than your place. And we're having church Sunday morning. And I kept thinking to myself, Lord, we need this place right here. We don't have a place to go to Sunday morning. Cheryl's thinking about having church in her kitchen. I got 100 chairs coming in three days. What am I going to do with them? Lord, we need this place. Please listen to this guy. We need this place. But that was not God's plan. And that was not me. And uh, I was shocked at about this. And finally, when I was getting ready to leave his office, I said, Sir, um, you know, we're starting church this week, and I'm your pastor when, when you need a pastor. Because God loves that guy, folks. All the stuff he's done. And I said, we're your church when you need a church. You come. We'll be starting down there Sunday morning. Walked out of there thinking, what is God doing? But folks, at the moment that this dear, this dear group of people needed God to show up, he showed up in marvelous ways. And so we ended up having church service. There we go. Turned out that afternoon we got a call from the guy building that building at the time. Federico was kind of a half Jehovah's Witness, interested in Jesus Christ guy. He had come to an evangelistic done with thing we had done with tacos. He found out we were in trouble. Called Sergio and said, look, i got two, two apartments upstairs. They're not finished, but you can have them. And we went and looked at them. There's no water, no electricity, but they were beautiful. They were almost all done except for that. We said, we'll take them. And uh, not, little did he know that we were going to stay there too. We said, we want to rent these out. We want to stay here. They were brand new, just what I told the guy. They were beautiful, brand new. They're small, but they were brand new, and they were cheaper than what that guy offered us, just like I told him. And he didn't charge us rent for three months because we didn't have electricity. We just used extension cords and stuff. And then uh, he hasn't raised our rent in two years. So the Lord was honest and truthful in everything he did, and that church started. Now, how do you do a church in three days, guys, not being able to tell anybody you're to open up church? This is not what you're supposed to do when you're starting a church. We had no time to tell anybody. We had no time to get anything together. But that's how many people. That was opening Sunday morning. We were shocked. We couldn't believe it. All these people came out of the woodwork because God showed up. And you know what happened? They knew it. It wasn't us. They knew God was there. And that's what they're looking for. And when the Lord shows up in our lives, our neighbors and the people around us are looking for Him and they need Him. And they came. I have to close. My time is gone. And uh-oh, I'm really done here. Two minutes and I'm done. Sorry. Two minutes and I'm done. Uh, we had the dedication. We bought land in uh, this last year with an ADF loan. That's what it is. It's only three-quarters of an acre, but it's a beautiful piece of property. We had a dedication on service with tents. We baptized 21 people. We had 140 people there. I'm going to go back this year and next year start building something to start having a church there. We're going we're gonna to praise the Lord and ask the Lord to let us start church there, keep church in the other place as well. We don't want to get rid of the other place. And this is what we want to do. About a 10-year project about 700 people sanctuary so that we can have a church planning base to reach out into the city of Guadalajara and the circle of silence. That's our long-term goals, guys. And our core group is excited because they believe God will show up when we need Him. Amen? Okay, if you desire to help someday down the road with getting this thing started in construction, we can use your help. Guys, come on up, please, music. It's 33 bucks a square foot. That's really cheap 
in construction terms. So we're thankful to the Lord for those things. We want to start somehow, somewhere, and we want to get going. So we're going to close. The guys are going to come. Uh, we're going to sing. But as we're closing, I thank you guys for hanging around today uh, and for the time you've been. The, the people who are working with us, folks, have become convinced that the Lord is going to show up in their lives. And they are following Him. And I'm so proud of them. and I love them so much for that. It's the same thing with you and I. Where are you today? How are you today? How are you doing today in fulfilling that priestly call God has on you? It might be going across the block to share about this almighty, powerful, loving God and to share Him, not it. And it might be across the state. It might be across the city. It might be across the world. Where are you? God has called all of us, every one of us today. None of us are exempt from this. It is His purpose for our lives.